I'm at a spot called Middling Bank on the shores of Lake Eucumbine in the New South Wales Snowy Mountains today and I'm about to try and catch a trout from the shoreline using fly gear. This lake's been rising right through the past spring and summer and inundating new ground and it's been fishing really well. In fact, according to a lot of people, the trout fishing here at the moment is the best that it's been in a generation. They're catching plenty of browns and some really nice rainbows as well, which is great news because the rainbows have been a bit lacking across the previous decade, but they've made a real comeback. Now, catching them from the shore isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. There's a lot of water out there, a lot of water between fish. I've got a wet fly on, a slightly weighted wet fly on the point and an unweighted nymph on a dropper a bit higher up. It's not the best time of the day, it's early afternoon, bright, sunny and as you can probably hear fairly windy but I'll give it a go, let's see how we go. I've chosen a stretch of sloping bank with flooded grasses along the edge and not too much behind that might get in the way of a back cast. I'm using a G Loomis NRX Plus 10 foot 6 weight rod with a weight forward 7 weight floating line and a long leader, about 16 or 18 feet all up, say 5 to 6 metres. After casting the flies, I allow them to sink for a few seconds before beginning a fairly slow retrieve. Figure eighting the line like this produces a very natural action. Work the flies all the way into the shallows, then pick up, take a step or two and cast again. It's all about covering water, and I'm really impressed by the ability of this rod to punch out a long line, even in the nagging breeze. It's a very potent weapon. But despite my best efforts and lots of casts, I'm just not finding any action. Despite mixing up my retrieves and changing flies a few times, it's just not happening. About all I'm getting is some handy casting practice. Tucking the rod up under your arm and doing a double-handed strip like this at various speeds is another option that can sometimes produce the goods. But not today, it seems. <laughs> I'm starting to run out of ideas. All I can do is keep belting it out there and hoping for the best. Surely there's at least one trout out there with my name on it. Well, that was actually pretty frustrating. I saw a few fish, I saw a few rises, a few jump. Most of them were out of casting range, which is really frustrating. I did get one half-hearted tap, but that was it. I need to get out there in a boat and get amongst them, and I also need some inside knowledge. Tomorrow morning I'm going to get both, because I'm going to catch up with two amazing fly fishermen who have made a real art form out of lock-style fly fishing out of drifting boats on these big lakes. And uh, I reckon I'm going to learn a thing or two. Can't wait. Next morning I hooked up with my two high profile fly fishing companions and regular competition anglers, Craig and Dave. We headed for the boat ramp on the Buckandera arm of Lake Eucumbeen. Conditions were reasonably calm and overcast and it felt quite fishy to me. My expectation levels were high. Craig Dawson's the president of the New South Wales and ACT chapter of Fly Fish Australia and has represented his state and country many times, both here and abroad. His mate David McCallum is also an extremely capable and successful competition fly fisher with lots of international experience. Eucumbeen was flat and calm and we wasted little time getting to one of the bays that the guys were keen to investigate as they pre-fished for the coming State of Origin comp between the New South Wales and Victorian chapters of the FFA. By the time we stopped, the cloud was starting to burn off and some breeze had kicked in. Craig and Dave take all this into consideration when choosing their flies. Typically, they'll fish three flies on a long leader, each fly spaced about five feet apart. Another vital tool is the specialised drogue or sea anchor, which is deployed to slow and control the boat's drift. Its angle and distance from the hull are constantly tweaked throughout the day as conditions shift. Long casts are made downwind using an incredible variety of fly lines from 
full floaters to intermediates and sinking lines of various densities. Sometimes an angler will change lines half a dozen times in a session. Retrieves are also constantly tweaked. Craig's kicking off here with a figure eight, but note the subtle nuances like that flicking forefinger. Tiny details can make a huge difference to results. So can that all-important hang at the end of each retrieve. Many trout take the fly during this exaggerated pause and the subsequent lift of the rod. Mostly it's about observation, experimentation and covering water. But Craig in particular places huge emphasis on always being in contact with his team of three flies. Often the two will choose different line densities and flies to fish different parts of the water column. And today it's Craig who draws first blood with a chunky little rainbow trout. In a comp he'd have to remain seated and net his own fish, but today the guys are just social fishing, so things are much more relaxed and they get to enjoy the action without stressing too much about dropping a point scoring fish. All the flies are barbless too, and the trout release extra well. Not to be left out of the action, Dave was soon hooked up on a solid fish that slugged away down deep and put a beautiful bend in his six weight rod. 10 foot six weights are the most popular rods for this style of fishing, and they do the job well. Oh yeah, nice fish. These rods offer the ideal combination of casting, line control and fish handling. Most lock style fishers tend to choose tippets of about 0.2 millimetres in diameter, which test around 6 pounds. Sometimes you might need to go lighter to get bites, but that's something the guys would prefer not to do if possible. Although we were getting a few fish in this bay, Craig and David were keen to explore some fresh options. So we pulled stumps and made a long run up the lake. And as we travelled, the sun came out and the water turned into a blue mirror. These are far from ideal conditions. But you play the hand you're dealt, and both these skilled anglers are quietly confident of pulling at least a few fish under most conditions, even a glass out. It's simply a matter of constantly trying different lines, retrieves and flies until something works, because almost inevitably it will. Got him. <laughs> Snooze you lose, Davey. What's going on? Bigger fish might run out the slack line coiled on the deck and get you back onto the reel, but the average trout is fought just like this, by hand stripping line, using that long soft rod to soak up the lunges and head shakes and allowing a little line to slip between your fingers when the fish dives or runs. It's critical to protect that relatively fine tippet and small hook, but also essential not to give the trout any slack that might allow it to shake the barbless hook out of its mouth. These yucan bean fish are especially fit and powerful for their size, and they simply don't give up until they're safely in the net, often giving the angler a few nervous moments along the way. You really can't rush them. And here Craig offers the perfect demonstration of keeping your cool and calmly dealing with a hooked trout. Maintaining smooth pressure, but always willing to yield a little line when that pressure builds. It's pretty exciting stuff, especially when you first see your opponent. Brownie. This one's a chunky brown, a wild fish spawned in one of the lake's tributaries a few years earlier. Nice release, Craig. I'd already learnt heaps by watching these two master practitioners plying their trade. They were poetry in motion, particularly in the way that they keep mixing it up, trying different lines, retrieves and flies. They were always thinking, always probing, not happy to simply accept the inevitable quiet spells. That's why they're so good at what they do. That fish has come up a couple of times in there. But with a few trout starting to rise, splash and even jump clear of the water, <laughs> I was chafing at the bit to have a go myself. There's only so long you can watch. At their generous invitation, I stepped up and I was stoked to pin a couple of lovely trout myself. It's 
Is that a brownie? Oh. I reckon it is. Yep. Sure is. I've done very little of this lock style fishing as it's known, named after its place of origin on the Scottish locks. And I was more than happy to tie on a couple of Craig's beautiful little size 14 flies and give them a go. Thanks mate. Oh, on the, um, on the top fly too. It's in such good condition. I mean, he came spearing up out of the water like a rainbow. Swim, little fella. I was starting to get into the swing of this caper now, and when a trout jumped just beyond where my fly had landed, and then another one rose right alongside my line, well, I felt like I was in the zone. Oh yeah, they like that cloud. And that little bit of breeze. The anticipation was palpable. Yeah. <laughs> right up high in the water. This was a really strong trout. Nice fish. Coming your way, Dave. He's gone under, he's all right. I was like, he's all gonna come across me. <laughs> He's a crazy fish, this one. <laughs> You're right. The hooked fish was taking me right around the boat and yeah, certainly keeping me on my toes. <laughs> I've been rolling on all of this with the GoPro too. That's pretty good. I might be coming home for dinner. We're almost back to where we started. Oh, nice fish. Anyone who reckons trout aren't a top sport fish hasn't tangled with a fat, fit you can bean rainbow on fly. I definitely rate them. Geez, they got some power. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo. He's solid. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I reckon. What a pretty fish. I'm gonna keep that one. We only kept a few of the many fish we caught, but I was keen to see what they'd been feeding on when I cleaned them back at the ramp. This is always an interesting exercise and can help with future fly selection. These ones contained a mix of small invertebrates, including various insect nymphs, as well as a couple of larger mud eyes or dragonfly larvae. And just to reinforce the importance of these mud eyes in the diet of Eucumbeans trout, a few minutes spent lifting rocks in the shallows turned up this handful of spider mud eyes, as well as some little mayfly nymphs. There's certainly no shortage of food here. As of autumn 2022, Lake Eucumbeen is in excellent shape, with rising water levels and a booming trout fishery. Such are the vagaries of our harsh climate that this won't always be the case. But for now at least, it's happy days for those of us who love to chase these speckled immigrants, especially on fly. Until next time, this is Starlow wishing you tight lines.